This is Phil Kopman with an overview on embedded software safety. Every embedded system needs to be appropriately safe for its intended application. The issues that arise in software safety can often be quite subtle, but deadly nonetheless. As an example, in September 2016, General Motors had to recall 4 million vehicles because of a software defect that caused a fatality in a 2014 Chevy Silverado truck. The defect involves the airbag unit going into test mode during vehicle operation. If the airbag unit happens to be in self-test mode during a crash, the airbags do not inflate and the seatbelt pretensioners do not activate. This defect is especially tricky because its effects only appear when there's actually a vehicle crash. More generally, there are a number of anti-patterns that typically indicate you have a problem with the safety of your embedded system. First, if your requirements do not explicitly address safety, even if only to explain why your system is not safety critical, then that's a problem because it is common to have embedded systems that are safety critical in ways the designers did not consider. Next, assuming that safety is relevant to your system, you should be following a safety standard appropriate to your domain. If you aren't following a safety standard, that's a problem. Next, your safety analysis must address the likelihood of software defects. Assuming that your software is perfect and only looking at hardware failures is a problem. Finally, any life-critical application must have redundancy, and it's a problem if you do not manage that redundancy the right way. An essential theme for achieving safety is that it is not sufficient that the system seems to be okay. It is necessary that you are actually sure that the system is safe and can demonstrate to others that your system is appropriately safe. Correctness of your code is only a starting point because safety not only deals with the absence of bugs, but also making sure that the requirements for your system are also safe. Additionally, things break, and fault responses must be accounted for in the safety argument. This includes hardware faults such as broken components, transient faults, and just plain weird stuff happening, but it also includes mitigating the potential for software faults. Building a safe system requires multiple levels of mitigation to prevent a fault from resulting in a mishap. This is often called defense in depth to begin with, it is important to avoid faults from occurring in the first place. This requires careful, methodical engineering of software and hardware to avoid defects entering into service. It also requires using robust hardware design techniques to avoid and tolerate hardware faults. There's no such thing as a perfect system, but it is important to use engineering rigor to ensure that faults that occur during operation are sufficiently infrequent to achieve your safety goals. Given that there will inevitably be runtime faults in a system, occasionally a fault will activate, meaning that it produces an incorrect state within the system. At that point, it is essential to have a way to detect and contain the fault so that it cannot do further damage. For hardware faults, it is common to use error correcting codes and redundancy. For software, it is common to use mechanisms such as watchdog timers and exception handlers. If an activated fault is not contained, it becomes a hazard, which is an unsafe system state that is a potential source of injury or damage. Systems typically use fail-safe strategies to mitigate hazards. For example, a system might perform a safety shutdown if it detects a hazard or a fail operational system might switch over to redundant backups to maintain safe operation. In an ideal world, a fail-safe should never actually be needed, but the real world is a messy place and things go wrong, so fail-safes are necessary to provide a level of safety protection beyond simple fault detection and containment when things eventually do go wrong. If a fault activates, and then becomes a hazard that also activates, the result is an incident. An incident is a situation in which the system is displaying an unsafe behavior. 
There may be incidents in which quick thinking on the part of an operator or just plain luck will result in an okay outcome. However, an incident has to be considered as an unsafe system event that requires revisiting the design and use of the system, even if it only happens once. The problem is, once an incident has occurred, the outcome is not under the control of the system or the system designers. Some fraction of the time, an incident will happen in an unlucky situation and there will be a mishap, sometimes called a loss event. With a mishap, the incident results in personal injury, death, significant environmental damage, an unacceptable business consequence, or some other loss that should never have occurred. The key to attaining safety is to avoid escalation along the path of fault activating to hazard, activating to incident, resulting in mishap, as much as possible. In other words, at each layer it is important to mitigate all possible problems to the maximum degree practicable to make sure that the small amount of problems that inevitably escape from one level to the next are all taken care of before a mishap can actually occur. Achieving safety requires adhering to a set of accepted principles such as those set forth in the 1994 Automotive Software Safety Standard from the Motor Industry Software Reliability Association, known as MISRA. First, safety must be seen to be present. It is not acceptable to just assume a system is safe until you find out otherwise the hard way. Rather, achieving safety requires presuming that the system is unsafe unless convincing evidence has been presented to demonstrate that it really is acceptably safe. As a practical matter, this means that someone from outside the development team must be able to look at a set of written documents and use that as evidence to determine that the system actually is acceptably safe. That set of documents can include things such as test results, but in the end, if it is not written down, it did not happen. Next, the greater the risk, the greater the need for information. That means that a system that is highly risky in terms of severe consequences or high likelihood of a significant mishap requires more attention to safety than a system that is more benign. Typically, the higher the level of risk, the more engineering rigor and resources must be applied to ensure safety. Next, safety must be built in rather than added on. Taking an unsafe system and adding layers of safety bandages does not get you a safe system. Generally, if you have some code that was not created in accordance with a safety standard, the only way you can get safety is to throw the code away and start over, but this time actually follow a suitable software safety standard. Systematic, random, and malicious faults all matter. What this means is that you need to consider hardware faults, software bugs, random runtime system upsets, and security attacks when you ensure system safety. Next, safety must be both argued in writing and demonstrated in practice. Failure-free testing is not enough to determine safety. As a simplistic example, a microwave oven might work fine 10,000 times in a row. But if it bursts into flame every millionth operation, that's going to be a safety problem and you won't find it out in testing, but you will find it out when you sell millions of microwave ovens and some of them burst into flame every day. Therefore, the role of testing is to confirm engineering rigor in the design and analysis, not to establish safety all on its own. Finally, safety is a life cycle concern. Safety must involve post-design activities such as analyzing field failures, ensuring that maintenance is not compromising safety, and system retirement. It is worth noting that even though safety connotes the idea of harm to people, the principles apply to any system in which a failure is mission critical, meaning an unacceptable failure. That's true whether the problem involves harm or injury to people, or a loss involved in dollars, or just brand tarnish that impairs the viability of a business. It's almost impossible to create a truly safe system without a healthy safety culture. 
Generally speaking, a safety culture is one in which people take the need for engineering rigor and following established processes very seriously. The processes and techniques used to establish safety are seen as a way to help deliver a safe product rather than as a set of arbitrary hoops to jump through or things that get in the way of shipping. In a safety culture, no corners are cut and everyone's sure the system is safe before it ships. Most catastrophic mishaps involve a broken safety culture. A famous example was the Space Shuttle Challenger mishap. In January 1986, the Challenger exploded shortly after launch, resulting in the deaths of all seven astronauts aboard. The accident investigation revealed that the failure mechanism was hot gas from a solid rocket booster igniting the fuel in the external liquid fuel tank. We can see in this photograph of the Challenger the large brown-colored external fuel tank. On each side of that tank are white solid rocket boosters that are built out of stacked segments. Each adjoining pair of solid rocket booster segments is connected with a joint that serves to keep the burning hot gas inside the metal sheathing. A pair of O-ring gaskets is used to keep hot gases from the burning solid rocket fuel from escaping out through the joint. In normal operation, the pressure of the burning fuel compresses the O-rings so that the exposed O-ring area is minimal and it's a metal-on-metal -metal joint. However, if the O-rings are too cold, they fail to compress and can be burned through by hot gases. Several shuttle flights before the Challenger launched in cold weather and had observed burning of one or even both O-rings. But because no loss had actually occurred, the launch team became emboldened to launching in colder and colder weather. The Challenger was launched after a night of freezing temperatures, well below the design temperature limits for the O-rings. But this time, tragically, NASA's luck ran out. Hot gases burned through both O-rings and formed a jet through the joint that ignited the external fuel tank, resulting in the loss of the spacecraft. While the failed O-rings were the immediate cause of the problem, at a deeper level, the failure was that the booster design team had to give permission to launch in cold weather. The engineers initially said it was too cold to launch. However, they were told by the management hierarchy that the launch would proceed unless they could prove it was unsafe to launch. This was difficult to prove because previous missions had gotten away with launching in unsafe conditions. What should have happened is the launch should have been aborted unless the rocket booster engineers could prove the system was safe. In other words, the safety culture failed by defaulting to a launch situation even though the system was clearly operating outside its intended limits. Instead, the culture should have been that the launch would not proceed unless it was clearly shown that the launch would be safe. The violation of the basic safety principle that systems are presumed to be unsafe until shown otherwise was violated and was the root cause of this mishap. A critical piece of safety culture is realizing that getting lucky is not the same as being safe. Eventually, your luck will run out and a loss event will occur. Software safety has been the subject of research and increasingly sophisticated industry practices for decades. A famous and well-documented set of mishaps set the stage for modern software safety based on Professor Nancy Levison's analysis of the Therac-25 radiation therapy mishaps. The Therac-25 was a radiation therapy machine designed to treat cancer patients. Unlike previous models, the Therac-25 gave full safety authority to its software rather than electromechanical interlocks. The software had race conditions and other problems and in general was poorly designed software that made it unsafe. The result was numerous dramatic radiation overdoses that significantly contributed to the death of many patients. Since the time of the Therac-25, a number of topics have become accepted practice for embedded system safety. These include using safety plans and safety standards, creating safety requirements, 
using critical system design techniques, ensuring dependability, avoiding single points of failure, managing redundancy properly, using appropriate isolation mechanisms, and following well-understood safety architectural patterns. These topics will be discussed in the other safety training modules. The biggest overarching pitfall for embedded software safety is that being safe is not about whether you as the designer think you're safe. The designer and vendor of the Therac 25 initially thought it was safe. When problems were revealed, they put some safety bandages on. But the reality was the system was unsafe and no amount of safety bandages could fix it. The only accepted way to achieve safety is to design the system to be safe from the outset and be able to prove to a neutral independent third party that your system is actually as safe as it needs to be.